Hello students, from this class we will be starting a new series which will cover these topics okay and it is actually included in your uh, competency number BI 6.7 okay you can see all the thing that is related to water and electrolyte balance are there in 6.7 please note that uh, it also includes pH homeostasis and I have got detailed videos in which I have covered the entire pH homeostasis okay acidosis alkalosis what is the mechanism buffer everything is done right Actually, I have also got another video in my channel where I have covered these entire topics in a summary. Okay. Okay. I will give you the thumbnail. And if you are in a hurry, that's the hour long video. Okay. If you're in a hurry and that's a summarized video, it's hour long, right? But if I strongly insist, if you are not in a hurry and if you want to clear the concepts, then you please follow along this series of videos because I'll be splitting the whole thing into multiple short videos where I'll be covering concepts and we'll follow along and applying each concept to the next class. All right. So we will, uh, we have got multiple learning objectives. Okay. But in this class, what we will try to address is the first few, right? In which we'll learn outline the body water components and their composition. Okay. State the water balance in terms of IO that is intake and output. What do you mean by osmolality? Both liti and osmolarity. My thumbnail says osmolarity. Okay. You will learn both, right? And compare the electrolyte composition of body fluid. We'll be addressing this first four, right? And you can actually read along what are the total uh, learning objectives that will be covered in the total series, right? I said total twice. <laughs> okay, so that's a lot of total. Anyway, so we'll cover them uh, one by one. So first and foremost, without wasting any time, let me tell you, this chapter is of utmost importance in two area. Number one, Viva, okay, and number two, MCQ. You ask whether short note or short question can come, definitely they can come as one or two marks part of a short answer type question. So basically what you need to need to for these two area Viva and MCQ, you don't get to think, right? You need to know, right? The moment you start thinking if, and you don't know the answer, if you start applying your logic in all these factual uh, chapters, you tend to answer them wrong. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, so uh, just listen, the total body water in an average human being, okay? is considering 60% of his body weight is 42 liter. Okay, now you can uh, calculate so if 60% is 42, what's the total weight? That's the math for you, right? Everyone says the doctors are weak in mathematics. They don't like mathematics. That's why they chose bio and became a doctor. I say no, we are the best. We chose to being a doctor. Many of us had a degree in engineering, but we did not opt for it. <laughs> anyway, that's a debate for another lesson. Was it a good choice to being a doctor? I will make a detailed video on it. If you are having second thoughts, being a first year student. <laughs> anyway, so among them, we can divide the whole thing into intra and extracellular. Intracellular component is the 40% of body weight. That is 28 liter and extracellular is 14 liter, right? That is 20%. Among them, among the extracellular component, intravascular, that is inside the blood vessels, arteries, capillaries, heart, everything, cardiovascular system, intravascular, inside the vessel is 4% only. And majority is in the tissue fluid, that is outside the blood vessel, interstitial piece, that is 16% or 11.2 liter. Now you can see this amount can vary roughly from textbook to textbook, but is more or less the same. For example, the extracellular uh, body water will not be 40%. It is roughly 20%, right? If you are asking 40%, that is the intracellular. Again, this question might be tricky. Uh, in competitive exam, they may give you the total body weight. Okay, for example, a very fat or a very lean person, a person may be of 25 kg or a person may be very fat, 135 kg. For them, the total amount will vary. So you need to keep in mind the percentage instead of the actual liter. Both are important, but logically speaking, the percent is important so that you can manually calculate it. Okay. Next, the total water balance in the body. 
so these are the various uh, sources of intake and output so uh, when you become an intern okay or if you go to a ward patient right you will see a clipboard where a white paper is uh, hung right and i by o chart is being monitored by the sister or brother or the attendant what is i by o chart there is a total amount of fluid that is getting into the body and the total amount of fluid that is getting out of the body right so normally what happens water in food that is intake 1 to 50 ml right so i'm talking about the intake only going in in source oxidation of food produces 300 ml of water these are all standard measurement right and drinking water on average 1.2 liter right how much water do you drink you know for a healthy life take my word 3 liter of water per day is essential unfortunately for those if any are detected with urinary stone then 4 liters of water right but minimum minimum 2 liters of water is essential okay i know most of you are very busy you don't you take all sort of junk food and you neglect the water right it's not good practice at all please start taking water even if you are inside a class even if the water source is very far you don't have water filter but please and you don't look cool by carrying a water bottle with you please do okay that's my request so total intake is 2750 ml and intake should be equal to output if it intake is more than output then the body will swell up and if the intake is less than output it will be you will be dehydrated so what are the output sources uh, output source are urine 1.5 liter insensible perspiration and sweating okay both 500 ml lung 700 ml will expiring out water vapor right and feces 50 ml so 2750 total intake and output is balanced okay this is the rough amount you don't need to memorize everything but you should have a rough idea okay what amount of urine is produced what is normal water you should drink what is the total water content in balanced diet these are important not only for this chapter but also for nutrition competency number 8 okay so this is a big text over here it's a general thing so please try to read one line by line and you will understand very easy the major factors controlling the intake are thirst and the rate of metabolism fine the thirst center you drink water right is stimulated by an increase in osmolality of blood when blood becomes thicker it means we need more solvent to dilute it and the thirst center is stimulated so the body tells you please intake more solvent that is water okay leading to increased intake the renal function the function of the kidneys is the major controlling factor of rate of output okay the rate of rate of loss through the skin is influenced by the weather so when it is hot you perspire more you are sweating more and in cold climate you don't you feel good you are not having any sweating right so loss of water through the skin is increased for 13% for each degree rise in centigrade in body temperature during fever this line is very important what does it mean as your body temperature grows up in fever right or normally it is 98.4 degree fahrenheit in fever we have 99 100 101 102 so when it starts to rise the water loss also starts to happen so we need to a fever patient should drink a lot of water if it's severe fever if a patient is senseless we need to give saline infusion just to maintain the proper water just to tackle or counter the water output imbalance now in this slide we are seeing what is the amount of sodium amount i mean the concentration concentration of any ion is expressed in either m millimole per liter or milli equivalent per liter m e q per liter m mole per liter all right so we see uh, you don't need to remember each and every exact value right but what you need to know that the concentration of potassium is highest in saliva compared to any other body fluid right and the concentration of sodium is lowest in saliva compared to any other body fluid all right you can see on an average the concentration of sodium sodium <laughs> is more than 100 it's around 120 to 140 or at least in 100 to 120 across all the body fluid gastric juice bile pancreatic and intestinal secretion right but in case of saliva it is only 40 millimole per liter whereas in case of potassium it is 10 or below 10 in other body fluids but in case of saliva it is 20 so quite 
higher right chloride and bicarbonate is not that important mainly sodium and potassium concentration comes as an mcq so you should keep an attention in that section right here this is basically at a glance the same thing that we discussed is uh, actually expressed in a bar diagram format and the relative concentration of potassium sodium that is the major cation and uh, chloride and bicarbonate that is the major anion is shown in different body fluids so those include plasma interstitial fluid as well as intracellular fluid one thing we should keep a note that in uh, intracellular fluid the concentration of magnesium ion is significantly higher compared to that of other body fluid you can see major cation of plasma and interstitial fluid that is plasma and the fluid between the tissue space consists of sodium and potassium the value of sodium is much higher compared to that of potassium all right whereas the fluid that is inside the cell that was extracellular all these two are extracellular when we come to the intracellular fluid you can see the ratio of sodium and potassium just reverses potassium is huge 160 and sodium is 12 i hope you already know the answer why this is so it is because the direction of sodium and potassium pump sodium potassium atpase is a pump which you should know there is an active transport that drives out sodium and takes in potassium so that actually maintains the concentration of sodium and potassium which is strikingly different in intra and extracellular fluid all right so don't make a mistake over here fine so this is actually the exact concentration of uh, the various electrolyte in plasma interstitial and intracellular compartment i will tell you which ion you just need to remember in case of i already told you in case of the inter Stitial plasma and intracellular component you just need to mention I mean remember sodium and potassium okay you can see in case of intracellular the ratio of sodium and potassium is strikingly different compared to that in extracellular fluid these are extracellular all right uh, one thing uh, you should keep a note over here that you can see in this chart the value of calcium is given as 34 I have directly uh, referenced or cited this chart from the textbook of Vasudevan. Okay, if you find that the intracellular calcium concentration is given as this, it is absolutely wrong. Okay, in fact, the concentration of calcium inside the cell is almost four to five times lower than that of that present in outside the cell. Again, remember the intracellular calcium ion concentration is four to five times four to five fold less than that of intracellular extracellular okay if i am confusing you it's calcium is present more outside the cell and calcium is present less inside the cell all right but and regarding anion what you should take a note you should take a note that in case of chloride ion it is much more present in extracellular fluid and it's present much less in intracellular fluid and reverse is happening in case of phosphate phosphate is very low outside and it is extremely high inside so sodium potassium chloride and phosphate sodium potassium cation and chloride phosphate anion and also the difference between intra and extracellular fluid so those are the few key areas that even if you don't remember the exact value examiner might ask you just tell me is it more or less for phosphate is more inside the cell or phosphate is more outside the cell you need to just remember conceptually and uh, tell this remember phosphate and potassium go hand in hand so potassium and phosphate they are more inside the cell and they are less outside the cell okay next we see since osmolality what is osmolality i'll just explain in a second since osmolality is dependent on the number of solute particles okay major determinant factor is sodium just remember this i'll explain what is osmolality if you know what is osmolality you have already understood this comment right and if you don't i'll explain it to you therefore sodium and water balance are dependent on each other it's very much interdependent because when osmolality varies water has to uh, travel to maintain the osmotic balance right and which organ maintains it maintains kidney which either excrete water or 
excrete solute that is sodium right so we come to the definition of osmolarity and osmolality we have we all already know that we had chemistry in our class 2 class 12 right and we already know what is osmolarity and osmolality because we already studied water right but let us recap very briefly osmolarity is number of moles per millimole of solute per liter of the solution this unit can be number of something per unit uh, uh, volume of solvent okay unit concentration of solvent right over here it is per liter of the solution right so number of mole per millimole of solute per liter of solution and what is what happens in osmolality it is the weight that is per kilogram so number of mole per millimole of solute per kilogram of solvent so it is deter mainly determined by the electrolytes that is sodium in case of body extracellular it is dependent by sodium and intracellular it is determined by potassium however we are mainly concerned about ecf extracellular osmolality and that is primary determined by the cation that is present in maximum amount that is sodium okay again this is per liter osmolarity liter okay osmolarity liter okay and osmolality kilogram right so we are concerned about osmolality mainly right so as i told you plasma osmolality is mainly contributed by sodium major extracellular cation and intracellular fluid it is mainly contributed by potassium because this is the major intracellular cation i am telling the same thing over and over again so that it um, i mean it imprints inside your brain all right plasma osmolality so how will we calculate that right till now we just knew we just know the theory that it is determined by sodium determined by potassium but how what is the exact math relation so exact equation is 2 multiplied by sodium plus potassium so you can write like the 2 na plus k inside bracket so basically this 2 sodium plus 2 potassium so 2 the third bracket uh, these are called square bracket square bracket means the concentration of the ion in millimole so 2 sodium plus 2 potassium okay plus urea plus glucose okay but this is not complete you need to consider the units of urea and glucose in fact urea is represented as BUN blood urea nitrogen right so if we consider the exact formula it is 2 into sodium we can actually omit potassium in many textbooks you will find there is no potassium in it right so you can include or cannot include potassium since the value is so low it doesn't actually reflect any change in osmolality of extracellular fluid that is plasma so blood urea nitrogen by 2.8 so this is urea by 2.8 urea not urea this is BUN BUN is blood urea nitrogen and this is again in milligram per deciliter so if the unit of BUN is mg per dl we need to divide it by 2.8 and again glucose divided by 18 okay so unit of glucose is also in milligram per deciliter so this is the complete formula 2 multiplied by sodium plus potassium or just 2 multiplied by sodium plus BUN that is blood urea nitrogen by 2.8 plus glucose again in mg per dl by 18 if there is an additional factor present that is the patient has taken or there is a con somehow the there is an increased concentration of ethyl alcohol in blood okay then we need to consider that factor also not normally abnormally so if you are asked about anything else if examiner asks you in viva anything else is then in this equation that means examiner is so impressed with you he already has given you honors marks that is a distinction marks and he wants more then you can say plus ethyl alcohol that is by 4.6 so the complete formula at postgraduate level is 2 multiplied by sodium plus potassium plus blood urea nitrogen by 2.8 plus glucose by 18 plus ethyl alcohol concentration by 4.6 that is the calculated osmolality and its normal value is 2.85 to 2.95 milli osmol per kg since it is osmolality, if the unit is milliosmol per liter, then it is osmolarity. Okay, we are talking about osmolality, L, L, 
okay not lr right ll is osmolality and lr is osmolarity i hope i am uh, articulating it properly right so you don't need to consider about uh, etoh just forget it remember 2 multiplied by sodium plus 1 by 2.8 plus glucose by 18 fine you are done you don't need to know more but you can get multiple choice type of question in which all those parameters might be given and you need to calculate out the total osmolality and then mark the correct answer in the mcq if that is a scenario you need to know these equations right and remember you need to divide so glucose can be given 180 so that will increase the factor of osmolality by 10 because you need to divide 180 by 18 that will give 10 so you need to add plus 10 like that fine next we are actually seeing what are the major contributors what are the stuff solute that is present in plasma and how much they contribute to the total osmolality of plasma and we can clearly see as stated above major contributor is sodium so if the osmolality suppose my osmolality is 292 the value was between 285 to 295 right suppose my osmolality is 292 milli osmol per kg of it 92% that is 270 milli osmol per kg is contributed by sodium the value of sodium only and the rest are the minor ones right you can see total uh, extra other solutes other than sodium they contribute the 8% but definitely that is something so we need to calculate all the factors so in our formula we already saw we are calculating sodium potassium urea and glucose those are the main factors that are contributing okay so why do we consider all these things because there is a difference between measured osmolality and calculated osmolality now what is this what is major osmolality and what is calculated osmolality that is where the ethanol alcohol was coming right so suppose we are given all the parameters of the patient means we are given a value of his sodium what is the concentration of sodium potassium bun that is blood urea nitrogen and uh, glucose all those parameters we can simply get by just a test of his blood right so we calculate that osmolality and it comes to be around 285 definitely it can come right however if we directly measure the osmolality there is an osmometer by which we can there are multiple methods by which we can measure the osmolality of blood directly direct measurement and it comes out to be 292 <coughs> for example is it possible yes it is very much possible and that is known as osmolar gap okay so this is the measured osmolality which appears to be high and this is the calculated osmolality so why this gap this gap is actually due to presence of abnormal compounds like ethanol mannitol neutral and cationic amino acid etc and this is the correction okay so i already told you if examiner is asking anything else in this formula it means he has already gone to the calculated osmolar gap section of the answer and you are scoring quite well then only answer ethanol by there is a correction factor divided by 4.6 by which it is corrected and that will give us an idea of osmolar gap not only that it will also give us an idea about any alcohol poisoning or any other abnormal constituent in blood right in the plasma very 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 important so what is effective osmolality so we know uh, calculated osmolality we know what is measured osmolality right see just read out it is the term right used for those extra cellular solute that determine whether water movement determine the movement of water molecule across the cell membrane fine there are definitely we have all learned about osmosis how cell membrane is a semi permeable membrane it allows only movement of solute across the semi permeable membrane right and there are factors that determine that controls osmolality in such a way that will determine in which direction the water molecules are moving right so what are those solutes those are permeable solutes since cell membrane is a special type of membrane that allows some type of solutes that are 
soluble in the bilipid layer or biprotein layer okay there are some solutes that are also permeable right so permeable solutes such as urea and alcohol okay ethanol is definitely lipid soluble it is highly permeable into the cell and achieve osmotic equilibrium right it means depending on the need of movement of water molecule if we don't need any movement so these urea and ethanol present in micro concentration it is present in very low concentration they will move in such a way that they will balance out and create an osmotic equilibrium so that there will be no water movement right although there is increase in osmolality there is no shift in water so basically they are fooling the cell you get my point there may be in such a way that the actual osmolality is low that is the water concentration osmolality is actually de uh, determined both solute and solvent concentration but they are since theoretically in an ideal world we are only allowing movement of water that is movement of solvent to balance out the osmolality right but in this case what is happening the solute is moving to adjust the osmolality just because the solute is selectively permeable across the cell membrane so in spite there is an increase in osmolality water move molecule does not move because solute are taking the action i mean solute is doing the job on the other hand what if the situation is so that the osmolality is uh, imbalanced right there is difference between osmolality and osmolarity but that are only involving the solute such as glucose and mannitol remember this we are talking about ethanol that is ethyl alcohol etoh and mannitol is an alcohol of mannose right and it is impermeable so glucose molecule and mannitol they cannot move across the cell membrane they are present in ecf right so if these concentration if the concentration of these solute increase right there is an osmotic imbalance what will happen water will shift from intracellular fluid to extracellular fluid and extracellular osmolality will be increased are you confused if you are confused again just go pause the video go back 4 minutes and rehear what i just said and let me summarize it for you okay what you exactly need to remember for mathematical problems related to osmolarity this is what is written in the red line for every 100 mg per deciliter increase in glucose okay 1.5 millimole of sodium is reduced that is known as dilutional hyponatremia right hence plasma sodium is a reliable index of total and effective osmolality in normal and clinical situation so just remember if you are asked if i am to check if examiner ask you if you were to check only one parameter and comment about the osmolality what will be that the answer will be sodium 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 nothing else only sodium right next he may ask you okay uh, if the cell is in some kind of urea imbalance or alcohol imbalance so what will happen to the movement of water then you will say there will be no shift of water even if the extracellular fluid the osmolality is increased why because itself the solute molecule can move out of the cell okay alcohol and urea i mean they can go into the cell and achieve osmotic equilibrium right so in osmol c what is the situation the situation is extracellular osmolality is increased right because of unwanted solute present outside the cell so ideally what should happen water molecule should come out from the cell to the outside that is happening in case of glucose and mannitol poisoning so if glucose and mannitol are present in excess in the extracellular fluid that is osmolality is increasing what is happening water is coming from inside the cell to outside of the cell making the plasma dilute right so that is known as dilutional hyponatremia okay it means the amount of sodium it is getting dissolved diluted because excess water molecule is coming out due to excess glucose and mannitol right fine and it is resulting in 
equal achieving an osmotic equilibrium initially extracellular osmolality was high it was increased but when water comes out an osmotic equilibrium is achieved whereas in case of poison like urea and alcohol if they are present in excess in the extracellular fluid water need not move out instead what is happening alcohol and urea are itself going into the cell and they are maintaining an osmotic equilibrium okay i hope i was able to explain it quite clearly if not please pause and rewatch this video <laughs> okay and this is the formula remember 100 mg increase in uh, glucose 1.5 millimole of sodium will be reduced next another important concept crystalloids and water can easily diffuse across membrane but an osmotic gradient is provided by non diffusible colloidal particle this is a you already know that some fluids can move uh, freely but not other solutes right my mean colloids crystalloids can move because they are soluble in water crystal but colloidal particle cannot move The colloid osmotic pressure exerted by protein is a major factor which maintains the intracellular and extravascular fluid compartment. What if all the solute were crystalloid? Then everything would have been transparent, freely movable across the cell membrane, and there would have been no difference in the extracellular and extracellular fluid osmolality. But in real world, in practicality, in now right now there is a difference between the <coughs> osmolality between intracellular and extracellular compartment the osmolality inside the cell is not same as the osmolality outside the cell why this is so this is because of the presence of different amount of colloid that is proteins that is present in a different amount in both inside and outside the cell so therefore this exerts a difference of pressure that is a difference between extracellular and intracellular osmotic pressure that is also known as oncotic pressure and since it is determined by proteins which is a colloid it is known as colloidal osmotic pressure or colloidal oncotic pressure or colloidal osmotic tension okay cot colloidal osmotic tension or cop colloidal oncotic pressure or colloidal osmotic pressure all are the same thing right and this determined mainly by the protein that is dissolved protein in the extracellular intracellular fluid so but what will happen what is the importance of this if this gradient is reduced if this colloidal osmotic tension is reduced that means excess fluid if it is lost from the body okay the fluid i mean excess proteins are lost from the body the fluid will extravasate it will come from inside the cell to outside the cell there will be accumulation of tissue fluid all over the body and it will lead to edema okay edema is a clinical condition will be taught in the physiology if you have not been taught already edema is a condition where there is accumulation of fluid in below the skin that is interstitial space okay it will appear very much swollen and turgid if you apply a pressure it will create a depression dip okay it is a very important test that we uh, elicit in a patient with liver failure kidney failure because those are associated with loss of protein so loss of protein means loss of uh, colloidal oncotic tension i mean decrease of colloidal osmotic gradient water will extravasate into tissue fluid leading to the formation of edema very 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 important in many textbook older textbook it is also pronounced as o e d e m a is the same thing edema it is pronounced as edema even if o is there it is silent okay so remember colloidal osmotic tension or colloidal osmotic pressure in case of hypoproteinemia will lead to production of edema so now only two slides are left so we need to know the total osmotic pressure that is the total everything uh, i mean considering uh, the total pressure exerted on all the walls of the body all surface of arteries and veins it is around 5000 mm of mercury whereas the effective osmotic pressure is 25 mm of mercury if we just consider a surface area right and that the for, for who is the uh, i mean uh, protein component uh, on that that is 80% that is contributed by albumin and 20% it is contributed by the globulin so why we need to have a difference between the osmotic pressure intravascularly and extravascularly do you know why because there is an exchange of fluid in both arterial end as well as the tissue along with exchange of fluid there is exchange of gases everything so 
normally this mechanism has been designed in such a way normal physiology so that so we are seeing that the osmotic pressure since it's same because it's the same amount of fluid that is present in uh, the <laughs> i mean same concentration of solute is present across the whole uh, arterial and capillary end the effective resultant of the blood pressure which is much higher in the arterial end you can see 35 mm of blood pressure is exerted on the arterial walls right and the collateral osmotic tension is trying to um, draw in fluid and the effective pressure outward pressure is 10 mm of mercury okay and what is happening in the venous end in the venous end the colloidal osmotic tension is again same it is 25 mm of mercury we see effective osmotic pressure it is same across the uh, whole surface of the capillary but in the venous end uh, the since the bp is low we all know that the blood pressure is much low in the venous end of the capillary so effective pressure is 10 mm of hg that is sucked in right we <coughs> deliver out from arterial and that is exchange of gases we are supplying from the arterial end and we are collecting from the venous end so effective pressure is outward in case of arterial side and effective pressure is inward in case of venous side and also collateral osmotic tension pressure maintains the balance between the outward and inward function at the arterial and venous end of the capillaries so to summarize let me tell you few key concepts um, after which this video is already over <laughs> okay uh, so just know this at equilibrium the osmolarity of the extracellular and intracellular fluid are same identically if it is equilibrium means nothing is moving inward or outward so they are same right solute content of intracellular fluid is constant it doesn't change extracellular is the thing where things are changing and they are actually triggering various events whether something will go inside the cell or something will come out of the cell inside the cell it is much stable all right next sodium is retained only in the extracellular fluid okay next very important concept you see total solute of the body divided by the total body water gives the fluid osmolality okay total not measured not calculated total amount of solute that is everything that is present in the blood if we divide it by total amount of solvent definitely that will give the total osmolality of the body and last but not the least very important concept total intracellular solute intracellular minded inside the cell divided by plasma osmolality total solute inside the cell divided by the plasma osmolality will be equal to the intracellular volume so this is a very important equation okay they will simply give you the intracellular volume they can give you plasma osmolality so they can give you order 2 of the 3 and you may have to calculate the other 3 just by simply knowing this equation that you divide if we divide the total solute by plasma osmolality we will get the intracellular volume all right so we come to an end of today's video will stop right here and we will continue it in the next part i agree in, even if i told you this will be a small segmental video Con just trust me if we consider clearing a concept such an important concept of water balance 30 or 40 minutes is well justified so i hope that your concept is now very clear and will be able to make your friends or juniors understand uh, how water balance works and you will not make a mistake in any mcq that you will come across in this concept all right so in the next class we'll be dealing with the hormones that are regulating the water balance inside the body so thanks a lot for watching i'll see you soon with the next part of this class take care